will test what role, if any, energy has in the breakdown and self-assembly of the DNA and RNA test samples he prepared earlier. With park ranger Laura Schuster as a guide, he searches for a hot vent with just the right conditions to place his samples. It must have a temperature range of 70 to 80 degrees Celsius. Any hotter, and his DNA and RNA samples will cook. Any cooler, and the samples will remain unchanged. So, there are a few here. We'll move up a little bit farther. Oh, look at that. Yeah, it's nice and deep. You see how the edges kind of collapse, uh -huh. so be really I'll be careful. very careful about that. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is to make a yeah. measurement of the temperature. He uses an electronic thermometer with wire leads. He'll run the leads deep into the vent to see if the temperature range is right for the test. I'm reading about 49 to 50 degrees down there, so it's just not nearly it's hot not enough. Quite warm enough. We need another 25 to 30 degrees. Okay, well, why don't we check another hole over here? Now I'm getting uh, something around a little over 50 degrees again. So these are uh, just too damp, I think. The uh, uh, with the rain and all that we're experiencing, uh, just keeping the temperature much too. Um, cool for the kind of chemistry that we're trying to drive. They keep looking. And it's protected, which is another good sign. Oh, it's hotter. It feels hotter. This hole is close enough for Dr. Dima to use a standard mercury thermometer. Wow. 60. 70. I think this is going to do it. Okay, we got um, 75 degrees here. Looks like this is it. Yep. So I think I'm going to go ahead and try this one and see whether we can't uh, get the experiment to go. Perfect. That sounds great. I'm happy with that one. <laughs> Very good. Dima retrieves the small lava samples coated with DNA and RNA he prepared earlier in his lab. Protected in tin foil and secured in a wire mesh, they can endure temperatures up to 760 degrees Celsius. He's trying to find out if vents like this one will not only break down the building blocks of life, but also assemble them again. We want to see if any synthetic reactions occur, where molecules come together to make larger, more complex molecules, which is the most interesting, of course. If DNA or RNA molecules do self-assemble, then Dr. Dima will have uncovered strong evidence about first life, that it may have begun in a volcanic setting. We're going to give this about uh, two hours time. Uh, in the laboratory, we find that that's enough time for the reactions to occur that we're interested in. Tin foil keeps heat on the samples and prevents rain from cooling them. So what's going to happen is the heat will build up in there the heat activates the molecules and allows them to form links. Two molecules get together, they lose a molecule of water, and they make a link. And this is, in fact, what life does to grow. Well, it looks like everything's under the control here. Temperature up where it should be. And we'll come back in a couple hours and see what we get. If Dima's results demonstrate DNA or RNA self-assembly, it will be a major step toward unlocking a mystery of current life. It will also be a monumental step closer to creating life from scratch in the lab. Hawaii's Mount Kilauea volcano may hold the secret of first life. To find out, Dr. David Dima returns to see what effect the volcano's heat and gases have had on his lava rock test samples. He's coated them with DNA and RNA, the information archives of all life. These samples have been baking for two hours in a volcanic vent at 75 degrees Celsius. There's our samples. They're quite dry, quite hot. I can't touch them. You can see these little chips of lava, each of them representing a different experiment that we're doing. And we assume that some chemical reactions have occurred under the conditions of pH and temperature in this volcanic vent. Back 
in his lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz, Dr. Dima analyzes the results. First, he adds distilled water to the samples. This simulates early Earth's rain or tides washing over the dried nucleic molecules. The water loosens them from the lava chips, providing a solution where the molecular bits have a chance to get closer and react, assembling or breaking down further. The wetting phase stirs up everything that had been dried down originally and gives another try the next time around. So we cycle wet, dry, wet, dry. This wetting, drying cycle is uh, very important to concentrating the organic compounds required for the uh, origin of life. To find out if the DNA and RNA broke down and built up, he extracts the concentrated solution from each sample and places it onto an electrophoresis gel. The gel is an electrically charged slide that sorts the molecules by size. The larger molecules move more slowly and stay near the top of the slide, while the smaller bits move more quickly and fall towards the bottom. Once sorted, the molecules are stained for easy visibility. In a photo, Dima captures the microscopic results. The RNA are represented by the short, fat streaks. The DNA are the tall, thin ones. It's really quite surprising to me that RNA is more robust than the DNA. Here's the control RNA that was untreated, and here's the RNA that was on the chip that was treated. It looks like a lot of the RNA, maybe 90% of it, has survived these conditions. And that's good because early life needed RNA to be stable at high temperatures to survive. But Dima wants to see more than just survival. He's looking for self-assembly, the ability of an organic molecule to form on its own outside a cell, the critical step to first life. Self-assembly of an RNA molecule in a volcano would be a major milestone. Unfortunately, the blank columns reveal that no RNA self-assembled. So Dima, Sostak and Rasmussen's understanding of life's complex systems all have a long way to go before a living being springs from a test tube. Now, other scientists are looking for that complex understanding beyond Earth. Using NASA's space-bound Kepler telescope, scientists are hunting for small, Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars. They will examine more than 100,000 solar systems in the next three and a half years. They hope that some of these planets orbit at distances from their sun so their temperatures might be right for possible lakes and oceans. If rare liquid water is found, the chances of finding life and its origins are even greater. With Kepler, we expect that in the next three years, we will know of several dozen Earth-like planets. We will actually find out what are they made of and what, what is in their atmospheres, what is on their surfaces. And then finally, the question is, are we alone? But our best hope of recognizing an alien life form might come from creating life in the lab here on Earth using primitive biochemistries. We may answer the fundamental questions about the origins of life without ever leaving our planet. If the conditions necessary to start life vary beyond volcanoes and hot puddles, then life could be far more common than we know. But Dr. Bader believes it could also have formed in ice. These frozen flasks hold many of the same brownish amino acids created by Dr. Stanley Miller's hot spark discharge experiment. Years earlier, these flasks were filled with hydrogen cyanide and placed in cold storage. What's happening here is as the water freezes, uh, leaves behind little tiny brine pockets, a very, very concentrated solution. And this is where the chemistry takes place. And these little brine pockets can remain liquid even at very cold temperatures. Not only does Dr. Bader believe life on Earth could have begun in the cold, but also that alien life might be closer than we think.
in our own solar system but not on a planet on a moon Jupiter's moon Europa the icy satellite of Jupiter you know has a liquid water ocean covered with ice and you know people are intrigued about whether there's life in that Europan ocean I take a different view on it and that is that uh, probably a lot of the chemistry that we think took place on the early earth producing simple compounds may have or is taking place in the Europan ocean now in the billions of years in the future when our sun swells up into a big red giant and engulfs the earth all of a sudden the Europan ocean is going to melt and I look at Europa as a big frozen prebiotic casserole that could then undergo further processing have a second origin of life way into the future of our solar system whether scientists can unlock the secret of life's origins in the cold of a glacier or the heat of a volcano one fact is clear using that knowledge to create life in the lab would change the world as we know it scientists believe first life on earth emerged around 4.4 billion years ago with advances in protocell membrane growth and self-assembly we may be on the verge of a second origin of life and with it comes the potential to create a whole new world.